Hello, friends, and welcome to Radio Free Cannabis, coming to you from high in the hills of Oakland, California, translated into 195 different languages. We are the voice of the global cannabis freedom movement. Thank you so much for your kind questions and comments. Please keep them coming in. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and to let all of your friends know about it. Support the companies that support this podcast, Harborside, Homegrown, and Liberty Clothing Company. And before I get started here with my intro, I just want to uh, let you know about another cool hemp company that's making really beautiful stuff. I'm wearing their long sleeve stretch hemp tee right now, and it's like immediately one of these garments that just feels beautiful on you. But what really excites me most about Hemp Zoo is this hemp straw. Regular plastic straws can take up to 200 years to biodegrade. The hemp zoo straw, toss it in your compost. A year later, it's gone. Check them out. <clears throat> Today, hundreds of millions of people all around the world have developed a relationship with the cannabis plant. We come from different countries and races and religions. We have different levels of income and education, and we speak different languages. But to one degree or another, all of us are living under prohibition or the powerful social stigma that still lingers even after we reform the laws. In the modern era, the United States has been the main driver of the global prohibition of cannabis. It began in earnest after World War II, when US officials like General Douglas MacArthur imposed cannabis prohibition in societies where it had traditionally been grown, like Japan. That process was reinforced in 1963 when Harry Anslinger, the arch racist responsible for federal prohibition in the United States, was reassigned from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics to the United Nations. Anslinger is one of the worst villains in the history of cannabis, but he was an effective villain and his tragically twisted model of cannabis prohibition was adopted by almost every nation on earth, and it was drafted into United Nations drug control policy. Of course, the United States is also where the modern cannabis reform movement was born and won its first successes. And now, a majority of states have medical cannabis laws and 10 have fully legalized cannabis. My home state of California was one of them. After we legalized in 2018, I decided that the next logical step in my activist efforts should be ensuring that our sisters and brothers still in prison on cannabis charges, even after the law has been passed, are released. And that's why I started the Last Prisoner Project. The LPP mission is simple, to ensure that as we build this new legal industry all around the world, that the people sitting in prison for doing exactly the same things that we're doing every day are released and given the resources they need to build the lives that were stolen from them, to rebuild those lives. The LPP mission is ambitious and it's also global. We will not rest and we will not stop until the last cannabis prisoner on earth is released. We've begun in the United States but we'll carry this mission across the world as the legal industry grows and develops. Our next guest is one of the strongest, most promising young leaders in the cannabis freedom movement. She's been a policy advisor to the Last Prisoner Project, and I'm happy to announce she recently joined our board of directors. Natalie Papillon is a strategist, organizer, and policy wonk with nearly a decade of experience building momentum behind brands, causes, and candidates. She's a graduate of Yale University, and she's held leadership roles at Google, Rent the Runway, and The Future of Storytelling. She's also a writer, researcher, and curator. We'll spend most of our time today talking about Natalie's most recent work, which is an extraordinary report entitled Criminal Injustice, Cannabis and the Rise of the Carceral State, 
which was just published by The Last Prisoner Project. Welcome to the show, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. I'm honored to be here. Um, and I feel like with that introduction, uh, my week has been made, maybe my entire year, a highlight of 2020 for sure. Well, uh, my challenge in doing that intro was deciding what of your long list of accomplishments already uh, to leave out. So we'll get to some of them a little later in the show. But I want to dig right into, into this report, which has this, this sort of unusual term in it, the carceral state. Why did you choose that term and what does it mean? So we chose that term because we feel that while cannabis policy reform um, is obviously criminal justice reform, which we've you know, made case for throughout all of our initiatives, but for various reasons, a lot of members of the criminal justice reform community, which has strong momentum both in the United States and globally, have not been as um, apt to sort of tie the two issues together. And a carceral state is a relatively recently popular uh, term that's used by a lot of people in the criminal justice reform community to basically describe the mass incarceration and extremely punitive policies and criminal legal proceedings that are happening in the United States. And we thought by using that phrase, we can make a very explicit case for the fact that cannabis policy reform um, needs a seat at the table when it comes to all of the discussions around broader criminal justice related reforms. Could you give us a, a sense of the, of the scale of the carceral state? I know that the United States has a, you know, just a, a little fraction of the world's population, but we have a huge number of, of prisoners. Uh, how, how does that pan out? It's you know, quite dispiriting, but also quite invigorating. That's why we do the work we do. You're right. The United States represents 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And currently in the U.S., there are around 2.3 million people who are in prison, whether it's in county jails or in state or federal prisons. They are behind bars for various reasons. And the United States is probably the most prominent sort of examples of this carceral state because we are imprisoning so many people who live here for crimes, and I use the word crimes in quotation marks, um, that oftentimes rise no further than simple cannabis possession. Um, we currently have thousands of different incarceration sort of apparatus, whether jails or prisons or non-carceral penal operations um, in all 50 states and all US territories. And we currently see around 10 million jail entries in the United States every single year. So that's not 10 million unique people, but we see people arrest and incarcerate at least 10 million people every single year. And the 2.3 number, while it's staggering and unconscionable, doesn't only represents a fraction of the carceral state, because we know that there are currently around 10 million people in the US alone who are embroiled in the criminal legal system, whether that's through probation or parole or various other non-carceral penal operations. Um, it's morally indefensible, it's unproductive and ineffective, and it's also quite expensive. You know, that's one of the things that I think now that we're seeing more bipartisan support for criminal justice reform, a lot of people on the right tend to cite it costs much more money to incarcerate and imprison and deny people their civil liberties than it does to provide the services and help that individuals need, make sure that they can sort of live their best lives and avoid any trouble with the law. So this is, is really kind of incredible, these statistics that you've been sharing with us. So, you know, when I was growing up and going to public schools in the United States, I was taught that this country is the land of the free and the home of the brave, that we have individual rights and freedoms that nobody on earth has. And they always used to point to countries like Russia and China and other places and talk about all of the prisoners who were imprisoned there and the gulags. And what we're finding out really is that the United States is what, maybe the, the top country in the world that imprisons people or close to it? We are by far and away the top country in the world. It's American exceptionalism, but not the type you or I were taught in our public school education. Um, it's been 
a slow process in some ways, but I often say, and scholars much more qualified than myself, um, have made the very convincing case that the reason for this mass incarceration, the reason for the rise of the carceral state can be directly tied back to the war on drugs. Um, and as we make the case in the paper, and I think quite convincingly, though I'm biased, of course, the war on drugs has, especially since the early 1990s, really been a war on cannabis. And so we know that cannabis prohibition in the US, which has bled into pretty much the entire globe, is the thing propping up the carceral states in many respects. And, and that's why it's so important that activists and advocates and policymakers pay close attention and work to reform these cannabis laws, dismantle the drug war, and cease the continuation of the carceral state. Let's dig into into the history a little bit, right? Because I think hopefully most of our audience understands that there's this problem of mass incarceration. It is most severe in the United States, but it happens in many, many other countries around the world where the most powerless people in society are those who suffer the most from injustice. I know that a lot of Americans have been sort of sold on this idea that the massive racial disparities in cannabis law enforcement were just sort of unintended consequences of the war on drugs, just something that happened. But it's, it's actually rooted in, in deeper history than that. Could you acquaint us with that history, Natalie? Of course. And you know, I'm a little bit anxious to even sort of go through this history because you have not only been like the preeminent scholar in a lot of it, but also are quite literally in the history books, which is how I actually got acquainted with her work. But, you know, I think the high level is that drug policy has never, especially in the United States, been about public health or public safety. It's always been wielded as a tool of social control. Starting, you know, I'm going to be very U.S. centric, but we can, there are parallel examples in other countries. Starting in the late 19th century, the U.S. saw its first federal anti-narcotics laws, and those were against smoking opium, and those were explicitly used to criminalize and brutalize Asian American communities in the American West and Southwest. And from there, we really just see this mentality, this drug policy used as a political cudgel really expand, um, perhaps most aggressively with the criminalization of cannabis. So starting in the um, you know, early 20th century, we see this resurgence of a very, very powerful nativism across the country. We see rising labor unrest due to you know, Mexican immigration to the American Southwest. We also know that this is around the same time that we have alcohol prohibition um, and the temperance movement gaining a lot of steam. We see the horrors unleashed by World War I, um, which only forments a lot of that nativism and xenophobia. And that really lays the groundwork for a social context that is working to demonize what, I guess, members of the powers that were, um, which tend to be white, wealthy, Anglo-Saxon Americans, um, they were attempting to sort of maintain this racial caste system that under why the you know underlay the entire American society and they use cannabis specifically as a way to criminalize members of what Harry A. Anslinger who you alluded to earlier would often refer to as the degenerate races so we start to see propaganda funded by uh, American bureaucrats as well as their allies in private enterprise which basically takes this plant which to be completely honest, I've been in the United States since the 1600s, or what would come the United States since the 1600s. They tried to make this seem like an alien substance that was corrupting the moral well-being as well as the actual lives of, once again, white Anglo-American um, school children and, and individuals. And they link the use of cannabis, especially the social use of cannabis, with groups like Mexican immigrants in the Southwest, and then these newly enfranchised African Americans in the American South, especially um, members of both of those groups who are gaining prominence, whether politically or in pop culture, due to things like the jazz movement um, and sort of great migration into northern cities. 
And from there, you know, I could really spend hours and hours speaking on this. We see on the floor of Congress brutally racist and xenophobic testimony being presented to Congress people who, to be totally fair, had no idea what the social use of cannabis was or not particularly perturbed by it if they had any idea. What we see this tying in with cannabis and crime and race and um, nationalistic or nativist sentiment, and that works to engender the passage of the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, which de facto criminalized cannabis on the federal level. And then we see that sort of legislation continue to get more and more punitive over time. What with the 1951 um, Boggs Act or the 1956 Narcotics Act, we see the penalties for simple you know, cannabis possession inflate in such a way that in states like Virginia was the most heavily penalized crime in the entire Commonwealth. So first degree murder would net you a 15 year mandatory minimum, cannabis sales, 20 year mandatory minimum. So this narrative that was spun by um, people who had entrenched interest in sort of maintaining the status quo continues into today um, and unfortunately has not only really bastardized the United States criminal legal system, has spread across the country due to sort of grandstanding and political machinations by American bureaucrats. Well described. The criminalization of cannabis in the United States was a matter of racial control. If you go back and you read the legislative record, and Natalie and I have both done that, you would just be absolutely shocked by the explicit racist language which is being used. And you can check it out. Just Google Harry Anslinger quotes and uh, your ears are going to burn. You're going to feel like taking a hammer up and smashing the guy when you hear the things that, that he said. So um, what we are seeing today with the war on cannabis is the result in North America, and I think many other places around the world, of long-standing racial domination and desires uh, to maintain racial supremacy, to maintain white supremacy. It's just another tool in the toolbox. So let's talk about how that tool operates today. One of the things that you've said is in the, in the report is that cannabis is uh, not a gateway drug as usually thought of in terms of leading to more dangerous substances, but it is a gateway in the sense that it's a gateway into the criminal justice system for black and brown people. Uh, let us know how that works on the ground. So as I'm sure everyone listening is well aware, cannabis is not a gateway drug. There have been reams of scientific studies um, that demonstrate that, though there are people in the political consciousness who like to repeat that lie, to be totally honest. And it was it was an orchestrated lie, if you go back in sort of the congressional record, like Steve and I have. But for you know law enforcement agencies and political uh, sort of leaders, what cannabis has been really effective at doing, or rather the criminalization of cannabis has been effective at doing, is basically giving law enforcement agencies a tool to brutalize and oppress undesirable, and that's once again in quote, communities. So in the 70s and early 80s, when we saw across the country, you know, to be fair, an uptick in, in violent crime, one of the things that emerged from this was this philosophy of broken windows or this philosophy of proactive policing. And what that really is, is let's, it's a preemptive strike um, and it's used to basically round up generally young men of color in traditionally urban settings, um, criminalize them, sort of put them under state control. It's like a managerial style of justice um, and make sure that they are sort of basically warehoused in prisons or, or sort of through like probation or things like that. Um, so they do not have a freedom of movement. They do not have all of the civil liberties guaranteed to them under the U.S. Constitution. Um, and that they basically are, are further othered and not considered part of the American civic society. And as we all know, um, cannabis is 
is popular amongst all racial groups, all ages, all demographics. Um, it's not more popular in the black or Latinx community than it is in the white community here in the US. But what legislators figured out and police chiefs figured out is it's still criminalized. And so if you could cite and sort of arrest and imprison um, traditionally you know, black and, and brown communities for doing this, it was a really easy cut and dry way of warehousing these populations um, and sort of engendering the like political goodwill of people who were attracted to a law and order advocacy sort of campaign. And starting in the 70s and, and really skyrocketing in the early 90s, we see marijuana or cannabis arrests skyrocket, especially in um, big cities with large minority population. And so I'm based in Brooklyn right now, if you can't tell from a little bit of the sirens sort of going about. In the early 1990s, New York would see around 1,000 cannabis arrests a year. It's a big city, 8 to 10 million people, depending on the year. And, you know, beat cops in New York before the early 90s would be laughed at by their precinct commanders if they were to ever, you know, apprehend someone for, for smoking um, weed. It would be like, I cannot believe you wasted your time, your energy, that sort of potentially risk a confrontation so you could bust someone for this. And New York had actually decriminalized cannabis possession in most ways in the late 70s for that very reason. Enter this law and order rhetoric, enter this, um, you know, uptick in proactive policing and, and broken windows policing. And you have the police chiefs in New York City, as well as the mayor um, and other civic leaders say, go into these neighborhoods, disproportionately black and brown, and arrest anyone and everyone you can find for cannabis possession. Doesn't matter if the arrests are constitutionally <laughs> um, enabled, We'll work on the courts. We'll parallel path this with the courts and legislators to make sure um, that you all sort of can erode civil liberties and make sure that this criminal record allows them to, allows us rather to maintain control of them for the rest of their lives. And unfortunately, this strategy was, you know, horrific, but quite brilliant. And we see, you know, cannabis arrests in New York which reflects cannabis arrests around the country, skyrocket to around 50,000 a year, just a decade after they were less than 1,000 a year. And so when we talk about broken windows, when we talk about stop and frisk, we all know those are, not we all know, but many of us have come to the realization these are incredibly destructive and ineffective policies. Um, they don't make communities any safer. In fact, they make them less safe. But what we oftentimes don't connect with these policies is the fact that they were basically propped up by the criminalization of cannabis. And that is why you see so many um, actors and officials in the law enforcement agency community who fight tooth and nail to make sure cannabis remains criminalized so they still have that tool in their arsenal and they can continue to perpetuate the oppressive policing of minority neighborhoods. So cannabis sort of acts as the, the wide end of the funnel. It gives the police a reason to go after almost anybody. And since lots of different people enjoy cannabis, it, they have a lot of targets. They arrest someone, they get their name, they get their photograph, they get their fingerprints. They put them on some type of supervision. Then you miss a meeting or you don't show up for a hearing on time. Or maybe you submit a urine test that shows that you actually consumed cannabis again, and then you get another strike against you. And then there's a series of these things, and, and people end up literally, like Natalie said, stuck in the criminal justice system forever. So cannabis is this gateway into a life destruction, really. And, you know, I've been in those prisons. I've been in the jails. I've been the only white guy uh, in there. The statistics, the reality on the ground is exactly the way that Natalie's describing it. In federal prisons, 87% of cannabis prisoners are people of color. It's really clear what's going on. This story um, has a lot of sadness and a lot of uh, horror uh, to it. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but I want to drive this home. Natalie, in the course of your research, what were some of the things that, that you came across that 
that really were the moments that just took your breath away? You know, Steve, I, I really thought there wouldn't be any, and unfortunately, every 10 minutes, there was another egregious case or violation that was incredibly infuriating, but heartbreaking at the same time. I think given the moment the United States and minute much of the world is in right now, I was particularly moved by stories of police brutality that stemmed from cannabis-related violations, or alleged, rather, <laughs> cannabis-related violations. So we now have, unfortunately, um, lots of names of, of Black Americans who have become slogans for the over-policing and oppressive policing of their communities and of race. And what I learned was that so many you know, of these stories were directly tied in to the story of cannabis criminalization. So Philando Castile, who was killed by a Minneapolis police officer in 2016, stopped by the police. It was his 53rd time being stopped by the police in his car um, in the 13 years he'd had a driver's license. And he was stopped for a routine sort of traffic stop. We know it was racial profiling. No one stopped 53 times in 13 years otherwise. And this school cafeteria worker, um, you know, went to tell tell the officer, you know, he was very accustomed to this machinery. And he mentioned that he had illegally sort of purchased and maintained firearm in his car. Now, instead of engaging with Castile like he was trained to do, the officer in question shot him at least seven times, or shot into the car at least seven times, killing him as a four-year-old girl sort of wailed in the back seat, his girlfriend's daughter. And when you know, this case got a lot of national attention, the cannabis sort of connection was underplayed, unfortunately. And what happened was in the testimony, the officer said, well, when I walked into the car, I could smell burnt marijuana. That smell made me fear for my life. Now, first of all, this is perjury. Um, he lives in Minnesota. I can guarantee you this 20 something year old police officer had smelled cannabis quite often <laughs> in his lifetime. Probably, you know, I'm not going to, I don't have any evidence to back this up. I would assume he's consumed given that over 50% of Americans have consumed. But that sort of slandering of Castile's name, as well as the fact that cannabis possession is a crime in Minnesota, basically empowered the jury to let the officer, you know, quit him of all charges and let him evade responsibility. So it was like the pretense for engaging in this fatal confrontation was this guy, Castile, was doing something bad, doing something illegal. And that shows he's a bad person and a dangerous person. And so I was therefore justified to murder him in front of a four-year-old for doing absolutely nothing wrong. And sadly, these stories are very, very frequent. Um, we know that there's been a lot of attention on no-knock arrests and SWAT raids. Just, you know, a few weeks ago, I learned of a 92-year-old woman who was killed by police officers who were looking for her nephew or her son uh, or her grandson, rather, who had been suspected of maybe selling some cannabis at some point. And they burst in, flash, you know, flashbang grenades, middle of the night, and shot this 92-year-old woman dead. These are the sort of things that are not just hysterical reactions to any purported crime, but are particularly hysterical um, and unconscionable when we think about what the purported aims as they purported, you know, the real aims of these sort of encounters are. And there are hundreds, thousands, truly millions of stories very similar to the ones I just shared today. <clears throat> Those are tough stories, but I'm, I'm really grateful that you shared them today and that you shared them in the report. As a cannabis activist, one of the things that's happened to me repeatedly so many times over the years i can't begin to remember how many times it's happened it always really irritates me and people will say something like oh cannabis well that's not so much of a big problem nobody really gets hurt people don't really go to prison for that do they know actually 
people die. Lots of people die. And they're people usually who are, are least able to defend themselves, who our society should protect more uh, rather than less. Um, so there's been this whole stigmatization and dehumanization. And uh, another part of your report that really moved me as a longtime cannabis activist was your analysis of how the language of warfare has been used to uh, really to justify this this reign of terror that's been visited upon uh, mainly black and brown communities. Could you, could you describe what that language is and, and the role that it plays in this problem? Yes, and um, I'm glad you brought that up because I think this is one of the most understudied, most impactful elements of the war on drugs and the war on cannabis um, more broadly. So let's start from the name of this anti-narcotics crusade, the official name, the war on drugs. You can't have a war on drugs. We don't have a war on toothpicks. We don't have a war on plastics. We don't have a war on other inanimate objects. A war on people. But by basically um, making it a war on drugs, you give the American public a common enemy which allows them to a sort of unite in in sort of a blind way of all the directions of the powers that are sort of perpetuating and leading leading the conflict, the cr crusaders or the commanders, um, and then you also bolster the resolve of anyone who um, is inclined to believe in the mission of the war or the crusade more broadly. So even just by calling it a war on drugs you are like tapping into this almost primordial sort of us versus them group mentality that allows policymakers to perpetuate a lot of injustices and people to either not recognize that they're doing this or turn a blind eye to it because it's in service of a higher cause. It also, like you alluded to Steve, allows policymakers um, and other powerful people to basically dehumanize the people because they're not actually they're not actually going to battle with drugs they're going um to battle with people who may or may not use drugs um but by being able to associate those people with this hated um enemy you're able to dehumanize them and we see this play out not just with our current counter narcotics crusade but we see this in many other sort of elements of of human conflict. But when you're able to sort of name and shame something, you you basically take away people's ability or you hurt people's ability to have any sort of human connection to the casualties of this conflict. It, you know, it becomes very far away, it becomes very theoretical. And so everything feels almost more like a game or more like a um, simulation. And the fact that while this thing may just kind of look like a piece of paper, you know, a, a new addition to a penal statue, it's actually a weapon. And it's a weapon being wielded, to your point, Steve, against the people who need the most support, um, not additional problems and, and, and legal sort of citations and control. So when we use this rhetoric, and it's been most visible and prominent coming out of the White House, so battles, we're gonna double down, public enemy number one, the most dangerous thing in America. You know, there are many parallels to truly any other conflict we've had. We fall into this pattern that basically um, keeps us one track minded and just allows people to funnel more and more money and time and resources and energy and resolve into the one tool that we know is closely associated with, with war which is penalties and violence and oppression. And it's, you know, the war on drugs or the war on cannabis, which is what it really became, is particularly um, reminiscent of this because we actually are giving the law enforcement agencies tasked with executing this enforcement weapons of war. So, you know, in the paper, we spent a lot of time thinking about the militarization of police which is something that's very top of mind for people here in the U.S. as we see, you know, military-grade Humvees roll down suburbia USA. 
Um, we see police officers, you know, SWAT teams in full camouflage and ballistic vests and things like that. Those are not peace officers. Those are not the like cops from the 1950 show. Those are soldiers. Those are paramilitary forces that would not look out of place in a traditional war zone. And so we are not only talking about it as a war, we are equipping um, people participating on the front lines with these weapons of war. And as I described earlier, that often leads to the other inevitability of war, death, you know, wounded people, whether physically or psychologically or economically, um, and just destruction in, in sort of the hellscapes that are some neighborhoods have been ravaged by this conflict. Yeah, the language, right? The language is so powerful because it's it's picked up uh, in paid advertising. I'll remember those. This is your brain on drugs, egg commercials that started coming on in the 1980s. Then the same language is picked up by the media and it's repeated. And at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is mind control because our minds think using language and the concepts that we look at an issue with can drive the conclusions that we may come to. And so this use of, of the warfare language has been, I think, you know, really, really powerful tool in the hands of the prohibitionist. But as Natalie was saying, it's, it's, it's not just um, the language. There was also this massive influx of military hardware to police departments. And I remember exactly when it happened. It happened when the Berlin Wall came down. That's when it started happening. It happened when they couldn't sell us on the idea anymore that we are in this deadly confrontation with the USSR and they needed some other kind of deadly confrontation to set people against each other to justify these huge amounts of expenditures on military warfare, this growth of a culture of militarism and authoritarianism. And so, Natalie, could you tell us about some of those specific programs that, that brought that military gear onto the street and their connection to cannabis? Of course. So um, I often tell people who aren't immersed in the drug policy world or in the criminal justice reform world that even if you personally have not been arrested or apprehended for cannabis use, your life has been shaped by it. And nowhere is that, I think, more apparent, especially today, than in the militarization of law enforcement agencies. So one of the programs many people have never heard of, but I think is one of the most powerful programs currently operating in the United States is Section 1033. And that um, is basically a federal program that allows the Department of Defense to get weapons of war, so mine-resistant trucks, sniper rifles, flash bang grenades, uh, sort of very, very enhanced surveillance technology, things that you wouldn't, you would expect to see in, a, in an actual battlefield, um, wrongly, but you know, there's an expectation there, um, are gifted to police departments of all sort of, you know, strengths. So it could be reporting to a community of 10,000 people or 10 million people. They all sort of have access to these uh, machinery, this machinery and this weaponry. Um, and they can use it for free, provided it is used in counter narcotics um, operations, which was sort of the original intent, um, or, or now post September 11 in counter terrorism um, sort of operations. Now, there's not a lot of counter terrorism going on in, you know, Defuniac Springs, Florida, <laughs> or, or, or most, Amer you know, the vast majority of American communities. So these, this weaponry that is free, it's very expensive otherwise, you can see actually a price list on the Department of Defense's website, um, has to be, you, you use it or lose it, and it's deployed to police people who are truly smoking joints. You know, there are like countless examples pulled by um, amazingly gifted organizations who have shown that, you know, with this influx of federal funding via the 1033 program and its little offshoots, we see drug-related arrests and apprehensions skyrocket. And of course, we also see, unsurprisingly, though those encounters are um, more disproportionately aimed in communities of color. 
And so next time you wonder why this town in the middle of, you know, a small sort of rural area of Illinois has a Humvee <laughs> on its Facebook page, I can almost guarantee you it is thanks to this drug war policy, um, 1033 program, and it's affiliated offshoots. And one of the things we spend a lot of time on the paper thinking about is, you know, the American public is sick of the war on drugs. They are sick of the criminalization of cannabis. They feel not only like it's effective, they also feel rightfully lied to um, and sort of wrongfully in prison for possessing this plan or, or being in the, just even in a room with someone who may be in possession of the plant. Um, but policymakers, despite this overwhelming support reform, are not acting upon the public's desires or subverting the public's desire. And the rationale for that, I mean, it's a bit complicated. You know, you have moralism and, and religious conservatism that does play into this, but the overwhelming reason is that police departments and law enforcement agencies have a vested professional interest in perpetuating this conflict because they are quite literally getting paid to do so. Their salaries, their equipment budgets, sort of their basically position um, in the American consciousness are being propped up using taxpayer funded weaponry and programming um, stems from the drug war and is related to counter narcotics activity. So, you know, I tell people there are a small group of law enforcement officials and um, professionals who understand the futility of the approach. Let me rephrase that. The vast majority of law enforcement <laughs> agencies um, understand the futility of this approach. They've We've understood it since the late 80s, at the very least. They're a small group who are fighting against it. The silent majority, to use like an early sort of or mid-century American, American term, um, who are not, do so out of self-interest, not out of concern for the public's health and safety, because they are quite literally getting paid. That's who's underwriting their salaries. And so we must um, make sure that our voices at, as advocates and as members of the public like basically unpack that hypocrisy and unpack that um, unfortunate, like perverse incentive and push our policymakers to end this disastrous policy and, and other disastrous drug policies. Great explanation. And let's just underline this for a minute because I think the dynamic that we're seeing playing out in the United States is also playing out globally. You have the federal government who transfers massive amounts of cash and equipment to local and state police departments with the proviso that those departments must demonstrate statistically that they have used those funds and that they have used that equipment to make cannabis and other drug arrests. But the vast majority of drug arrests are for cannabis. So we're really talking about this war on cannabis. And it's financially incentivized. I want all of the investors and the business people who are listening to this podcast to think about this and think about what's really driving this war. There's this whole system of financial incentives. And now, if you take a look at what happens at the international level, you see a similar transfer, huge billions and billions of dollars, tons and tons of military equipment from the United States to countries like Colombia to countries like Mexico. Uh, the UN plays this role on a global level, funneling funds all around the world. And in every case, those funds and those equipments are conditioned upon the people who receive them going after cannabis. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, you know, people ask, why is it taking so long to make a change that is so obviously good for the majority of the people? And one of the reasons is because it's, it's financially incentivized in this way. It's kind of pretty simple. He who pays the piper calls the tune. So, um, Natalie, let's think a little bit about uh, some of the reforms that have been happening. Um, you know, one of the reasons that 
I think the move to legalize cannabis got some wind in its sails. And certainly one of the intentions of a lot of cannabis activists was that by legalizing cannabis, we would see a reduction in the racial disparity of cannabis arrests. But that promise hasn't always come true, has it? Unfortunately, it has not. Um, the best laid plan. Uh, I think one of the things that is a little wonky, but I, it's really important that everyone who's in this movement understand is decriminalization does not sort of stop or repair all of the harms of prohibition. And in many cases, it actually further perpetuates them and, and even grows them. So you can decriminalize, and it sounds great, great campaign slogan for a lot of people, um, but people are still going to consume. We know that <laughs> consumption, you know, all of our anti-drug efforts have had an oppositional impact, actually, on cannabis consumption, at least in this country and, and across the world. Um, it only allows certain individuals to potentially profit from this, you know, in states that have legalized. So certain states, you see people profiting, and oftentimes a lot of those operators want to understandably protect their um, profits. And in doing so, they deputize law enforcement agencies to actually crack down more on unregulated sales. So that's one dynamic that plays out often. And when you have this federalism, like in the United States, it's really tough to do so because, um, you know, you could buy legal product in one state and, and literally cross an invisible line um, and you're criminalized. So this like patchwork of laws and regulations makes it a very tough to sort of understand what your legal rights are in a particular jurisdiction. And it also makes operators who are operating in a regulated market uh, very invested in in trying to squeeze any profits they can. And they often do that by like recriminalizing it effectively. And we know, or we can infer as to who um, is recriminalized. I also think that, you know, going back to an earlier part of our conversation, when we talk about um, giving police and law enforcement agencies a tool uh, to further their other aims, even um, in a legal market or in a state legal market here in the US, the, because it's still federally legal, still sort of in the Controlled Substances Act as a Schedule One drug, a lot of the judicial underpinnings of the cannabis criminalization still exist. So police officers can still stop you um, and often do if they uh, suspect you being involved in any sort of cannabis related activity. And that cannot be sort of solved on the state level because it's still a federal crime, right? Um, oftentimes in a court of law, the same sort of dynamic plays out. Um, I often think that, especially in places like New York, which I mentioned decriminalized in the late 70s, but saw this massive uptick um, in the late 20th century in cannabis arrest. When you decriminalize but don't legalize, it actually makes it just procedurally and logistically a lot easier for a law enforcement actor to apprehend someone for cannabis. And bear with me, I know it's a little confusing. When you had to arrest someone, you need to have probable cause, you know, there is a danger of a confrontation, there is, um, you know, a lot of paperwork that goes into it, you have to show up for a court hearing, all of that. When you decriminalize but don't legalize or only legalize in a very prohibitive way, you lower the barrier to apprehending someone. You just need to give someone a ticket. Um, and I say just a ticket, it's not just a ticket. And as we explained earlier, have ramifications that stretch far beyond a fine. Um, but you actually are incentivizing officers to apprehend more and more people because they don't have to do the work that comes along with like a traditional custodial arrest. So there is this like, once again, perverse incentives for the police, for perverse incentives for uh, court actors to actually double down on the cannabis enforcement's approach, even if the laws seem to be more liberal. Yeah, well, I, uh, I guess we shouldn't be too terribly surprised, given how deeply entrenched structural racism is in the United States, that as we move to legalize cannabis, the ways in which we legalize cannabis are also going to reflect that structural racism. I'll give you one example. In the state of California, uh, 
as part of the um, legislature's um, attempts to regulate cannabis, they uh, passed a regulation saying that nobody who was convicted of a felony could ever legally work in the legal cannabis industry. Uh, and they have this kind of sort of mechanism that you can maybe get a waiver for it, but it's very, very expensive, takes a lot of lawyers. I got one of those waivers because I'm a felon, but there's a lot of people in a different situation who have been blocked from participating in the legal cannabis industry because they were doing the same thing before it was illegal. And of course, the majority of those people are people of color, and it's it's just one example. So I don't think we can leave this conversation, Natalie, with, without at least touching on the issue of of equity in the in the cannabis industry. You you touched on it for a moment, but you know what are your thoughts? We've been talking about uh, prisoners mainly here um, and law enforcement, but there's this other issue, which is that even relative to their population in the United States, the number of licensed owners of cannabis businesses in the United States that are people of color is a tiny, tiny fraction of what it would be if it was proportional to population. And in fact, since we know that these laws were put in place to oppress and control people of color and that people of color have borne the brunt of the enforcement of these laws, hopefully we'd see more robust participation even than proportional to population. And how do we tackle that, Natalie? How do we how do we make that happen? Yeah, this is a meaty topic and I'm glad we're covering it. So I will sort of answer that three bucket. Governmental sort of regulatory issues, um, the sort of moral and ethical imperatives, and then sort of the business case for this. So one of the reasons why we see such disproportionate representation of people of color in the regulated cannabis industry is because it's, as you know well, Steve, very, very difficult to not only you know, enter the industry, um, but sort of enjoy any sort of economic success because of the way um, our federal policies look and the way states have gone about regulating. So instead of sort of taking an approach like you would take an approach for any other sort of substance or, or alcohol, to, you know, being check a close, um, I guess, a competitor to the industry, these are incredibly cost prohibitive licenses to get, businesses to run, their tax implications um, that are, make it virtually impossible to sort of turn a profit in this industry, especially if you don't have millions and millions of dollars worth of capital. And we know because of structural racism, um, the people who have access to this capital are not, you know, do not represent the US population in any sort of way. So regulatory issues and burdens have made it pretty much impossible for those without, you know, connections or um, generational wealth or whatnot to enter the regulated industry. Um, and this is, so we have the, the criminalization is horrible and there's this sort of double, you know, doubling down on this by saying, hey, you know, this is actually legal and we're going to celebrate you, but only if you meet this incredibly strict criteria that to your sort of anecdote, you could never meet because we're gonna actually just flat out ban you from the industry. I think it's on the sort of business case for it. You know, I am not a wizard at this, but I did work in private enterprise before doing this work. It makes absolutely no logical sense to um, basically box out the people with the most experience from an industry. And what other, it's like, you know, starting a, a power plant and, and saying, we really want this to be great and amazing, um, but we're going to ban all sort of scientists from entering the building. It just, like, that is not how, I'm not an economist, but there's no way you're setting anyone up for success. Um, and given the history of this, you're actually just further perpetuating a real wrong. And then the last sort of and most important element of all of this is I do believe there is a moral and ethical obligation for us to make amends for these disastrous policies both on the consumer level and you know, the business level and sort of on the government level. And you'll often hear, especially if you're in the US industry, talks of social equity. And that, um, you know, people use the term reparations. I don't, I don't use that term, I think it's a little different, but it's making sure that we are um, 
apologizing for this unjust, ineffective, and just from the beginning, scientifically unsound policy by giving people a leg up to enter the industry and enjoy um, the economic and social success that comes with, with that sort of position in society. And I think it's something that is on all of us to continue to push for. We see, you know, a lot of people say, well, this is unprecedented. It's not. We are definitely in the habit here of making sure that people are all starting, not the habit that makes it sound bad, we are committed to in other areas of civic society, making sure that everyone has the best foundation to succeed, not as committed as we should be. You know, we have many programs that do that, that have worked successfully. And because this policy has been so explicitly racist and seen from the start, we should be doubling down our efforts in this particular field. Um, There is something so unbelievably viscerally horrific about the fact that you have some people in the United States who look one way, making tens of millions of dollars, doing the same thing, but at a larger scale, um, than the nearly 700,000 people who were arrested for cannabis in the same year. And I think that's just personally, and and I know Steve and everyone at the Last Prisoner Project, it's gut-wrenching. Um, but it also is, it has far reaching effect. So we already have rightful distrust of a lot of sort of bureaucracies and, and political machinations. This only further engenders that distrust, which is not productive for anyone and actually makes you know, the country less safe and less prosperous um, and less able to live up to the ideals it reports to, to claim and, and to to be founded on. So there are a lot of there are a lot of reasons to champion social equity, especially in this space. The ethical reasons and the moral reasons are compelling. I think on the business level, there's also a really compelling case to, to be made um, that you want subject matter experts, you want people from the communities that have the most experience with cannabis to be participating in your your industries. Um, there's another reason, right? Because we can, because we have this very unique situation with the cannabis industry, we're starting with a blank slate. It's new. The mores, the expectations, the culture, the way that we do things, that's all in our hands. We get to set those standards. And shame on us, shame on us, if after knowing everything we know, that we just create another industry that looks like every other industry when we have the ability, if we put our hearts and our imaginations into it, to create not just a new industry, but a new kind of industry that breaks the corporate mold and sets an example for other industries to follow. Natalie, we're rolling into our last few minutes together, and I'd like to give our audience a little um, a bit of a look into the fullness of your life and some of the other things that you're working on and projects that you have uh, underway. Could you especially um, tell us what's going on, but make sure to touch on the new history coming out? Yes. So, um, you know, cannabis, your criminal injustice, cannabis and the rise of the carceral state is not just this first installation that we've been talking about. It's actually a four part series. And the idea is to touch on cannabis criminalization and its impact on the entire sort of U.S. justice system. And so we will be coming out with subsequent installations. Um, Be sure to follow the Lost Prisoner Project and and go on our website for updates on the court system, on sort of um, prisons, jails, and non-carceral penal operations like probation and parole, and then sort of on the collateral consequences of a cannabis conviction. Because like you said, Steve, A lot of people say there are not that many people in jail for cannabis. First of all, any person in jail for cannabis is one too many. It's an injustice. Um, Second of all, 40,000 people, that feels like a lot of people by any stretch of the imagination. Most sort of Western democracies don't even have that many people in their criminal legal system in any sort of way. Um, But even if you don't necessarily get incarcerated for a long period of time, that charge or even just the assertion that you might have been associated with this by an authority figure carries with it over 10,000 consequences that can irreparably damage or change the course of your life. 
And so we, we want to make sure that we're touching on all of that. Um, you alluded to sort of the upcoming book that I've been working on in partnership with some other incredible um, historians and, and sort of uh, drug policy activists. That is, you know, a, a humble attempt to better contextualize sort of the history of American drug policy and specifically cannabis policy as we look at sort of the destruction it's wrought. So there are incredible sort of pieces of information and scholarship out there that, you know, I would encourage everyone to read. Um, we want to contribute to that canon by really being explicit about the rationale for early cannabis enforcement efforts and tying those into the present day. Um, you know, I'll tell a quick personal anecdote. I consider myself to be relatively well versed in sort of some of the atrocities committed by the US government and other governments. Um, I guess kids are using the word woke. I consider myself to be relatively woke and politically engaged. And until only a few years ago, I too suspected that criminalization of cannabis had its root in something a little bit more benign. Like in my gut, I, I knew it was ineffective and, and probably not great, but I suspected it was just like bad policy, bad science, you know, that and just perpetuating that. I was shocked to learn the real history um, as I sort of uncovered more and more. And I presume, and I've validated this in, in various ways, that many people have lost sight of this. And I think it's really important we do not. Americans tend to be a, quite an ahistorical people, and we see ourselves continue to sort of repeat the same mistakes. And while that cannot be stopped by one person or one movement, I want to do my part to make sure that we are fully aware of what went wrong, um, so we're not able to sort of throw up our hands back and say, oh, we didn't know this was going to happen, when we definitely knew this was going to happen, because it's been happening for hundreds of years. So that will be coming out now with COVID probably in the spring, and we'll be sure to sort of post about that. I think it's um, even just from purely like a, you know, entertainment exercise, it's fascinating to see how explicit this has been. You know, I like studied black history at, at Yale, you know, pr presumably one of the most like prestigious sort of um, institutions for this scholarship. And I had no idea this had happened. And so we need to shout it from the rooftops and at the same time work to, to effectuate real change. Well, Natalie, I can tell you that you absolutely are doing your part and then some. And it's uh, just been such a pleasure to get to know how your mind works, to get familiar uh, with your work. Uh, thanks so much for being with here uh, with us here today. Um, and just one final question: How can the audience stay in touch with you? So um, there are several ways you can follow me <laughs> on my personal sort of social media accounts, which are in Papillon. It's a hard name to spell, but it'll be in the show notes. And then follow sort of, especially if you're interested in the criminal injustice series, please follow Last Prisoner Project on Twitter, on Medium, on Instagram, on LinkedIn. We are constantly posting updates and um, we would love, it's, it's hefty stuff and it's hard stuff, but we are trying to make it as accessible as possible. So be sure to, to follow, hit follow, and you'll be able to gain a lot of this valuable information and learn how you can actually take that information and do something about it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, to the audience, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the United States here today and the unique history of the United States, the racial dynamics that came to play in our history with cannabis. But I think this conversation is of global significance for at least a couple of reasons and maybe many more than that. First, it's becoming more and more apparent every day that the cannabis reform movement, the cannabis freedom movement, in order to be successful, is going to have to be a multi-generational movement. This thing's not going to be done by the time I exit stage left. And, uh, and it may not be done by the time Natalie exit stage left, but it must happen. And so one of the things that I will continue to do here on Radio Free Cannabis is highlight the work of our most promising young leaders, and uh, Natalie is certainly one of them.
The other reason that I think that this conversation is of global significance is because we have prisoners all over the world, uh, different systems, in different ways, but this is something that all of us all around the world uh, suffer from. And it plays out differently in different places, but there's a common pattern, which is that people who hold the power, the elites, ban cannabis and use it as a tool to go after the people who have always found cannabis to be a loyal friend, people who are poor, people who have been dispossessed, who are on the move, people who are suffering from physical or mental or psychic stress, people who are seeking a closer connection with spirit. This is a movement that will continue uh, all over the world. Um, uh, we are not going to stop. I know that some of you are in difficult situations. I know that you may be living with people that don't share your views. You may need to hide your true self from almost everybody you come into contact with. You may not even be able to find the medicine sometimes. But don't lose hope. Don't forget that we are here with you. Hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world have a relationship with this plant. We are one family, we are one tribe, and we will take care of each other. Don't worry, we're coming. <laughs>